to tonight's teaching, I thought I'd throw a few questions out to you guys. The world's changing, we all know that. But I just want to know if any of you guys know the answers to these questions I'm going to throw out. Where do the highest number of billionaires live? Asia. Go ahead. Saudi Arabia. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, you're going to be shocked when I tell you where the highest number of billionaires live. Moscow. Okay, here's another one. I just heard these today, but I figured, I, you know, see if uh, anybody knew these. What country, um, oh, I missed the S here, has doubled the amount of their billionaires this last year? What country has doubled the amount of its billionaires this last year? Any thought? Russia? Go ahead. China. Okay. China. So we got Russia here has the most billionaires. China's doubled its billionaires in the last year. And we'll see how smart you really are. Where does the wealthiest person in the world live? Oh, boy, you guys are real smart. Mexico. How many know our world has changed? Before all of this, how many know it was the United States? Okay. So we see something is happening. There is a shifting of the wealth of the world. Remember when we heard our president when he said we want to distribute what? The wealth, move it around? Well, let me tell you, he doesn't have to worry about distributing it. God's distributing the wealth around. But um, last week we looked at an inside, or we got an inside uh, uh, look at what we believe, or at least I believe, from the way I read scripture and I see the signs. The Bible says that we have to be people who understand the signs of the times, of, of the beginning of sorrows. We're not in the tribulation period. But without question, we talked about last week, one of those signs was the increase of iniquity. How many know there's no doubt at all that the sin level has gone up in our world? There's no question. Things that have one time were considered wrong are now considered right. I'm not going to get into all that. That's all on CD and DVD. We have that. But the next thing I, I wrote on there <clears throat> was the increase, and this all comes from Matthew 24. His disciples said, Lord, how will we know it's the end of the world and that you are going to return? The second thing that, that is mentioned there is the increase of instability. And I have no doubt at all right now that we are probably in one of the most... Uh, Difficult seasons of life in our world today. People have no clue. They really have no clue to what the outcome of what is going on is going to be later on determined. Because when you look at even our own revolution in America, uh, it was quite a few years be between the, the forming of it and then where we got to the place of writing our Declaration of Independence and then eventually our Constitution. And... One of the ironies of insurrection, I'll give you one of these right now, is what happened today if you follow the news in Egypt. Does anybody know what's going on in Egypt right now? They're revolting in the streets right now. Women are being abused because they want women's rights, and they're being abused by the men. The Christians were just, I forget how many got killed and injured by the Muslims. So even though there was this supposedly wonderful uh, intent of democracy, this insurrection that came about now is just, uh, you know, uh, cascading into a much greater event because now you have all these groups coming to the forefront and who knows what leadership will eventually transcend uh, Mubarak. So uh, a lot of the instability is broken down, what I believe, in three areas right now. Number one, we see it all over the world, insurrection, which is revolution. For anybody that didn't know, they asked me, because somebody asked me a question about iniquity. Iniquity is just sin. But uh, insurrection is happening not just in the Middle East. It's happening now all over the world. Uh, without question, God is in control of all this. He's allowing these unstable times for his purposes. Secondly, because of what is happening, we are also seeing inflation take place. You can see that in the food market all over the world. In the United States, we can see it at the pump right now. We can see it uh, uh, in the barrels of oil and so forth. And uh, 
you know, things may get worse before uh, they get better. Only God knows that. And the last thing that's, I believe, bringing on the instability, and th this is somewhat um, spiritual in nature, but uh, our whole series has been on the powers and principalities, angels and demons. And I don't believe it's just a matter of ideology, because I, I see right now even one of our representatives out here, King, who heads up the Homeland Security, is getting a lot of flack about uh, trying to investigate what he calls extreme Islam or Islam extremists. And uh, they're trying to make him out, you know, some kind of a bigot and so forth. But anyway, the last thing that I, I believe is creating the instability is what I call Islam, an Islamic undertow. And, and what I mean by that simply is that this, that what we are seeing in the Mideast is not going to stay in the Mideast. It's on our shores in America right now. It's in England. It's in Europe right now. This is not about a Middle East crisis. This is about the mindset of the extreme radicals and even many moderate uh, Islams who believe that it would be a better world if you had Islam ruling the world. Now, I just want to share with you real quickly, I don't want to spend too much time. When you have Islam running the world, you have Sharia law. Ladies, you don't want to be under Sharia law. I'm not going to get into all the awful and uh, diabolical or uh, diabolic, uh, you know, things that go on uh, with Sharia law. But it, it's an awful thing, Sharia law. Women are like uh, almost second class. Uh, they are second class citizens. But the, the, beyond that, you have um, the extremity of the caliphate, which, which basically is a world that is ruled by Islam. Either you submit or you're done. That, that, that's the bottom line, that, and that, that's, that's where we're talking about instability in this moment. So anyway, uh, to say all that, I'm, I didn't even get to the scripture yet, and, and I'm not in a rush with this because this is significant what I'm going to be sharing with you in the next two weeks. Uh, I was in uh, Brooklyn in an uh, area the other night with my wife and another pastor and his wife, and my wife said, oh, grab a hold of this uh, newspaper, and it was for free, and it's called The Jewish Voice. And um, I'm not going to spend uh, too much time uh, on this, but I just want you to see news, not from the American perspective, because there's a bias, there's a spin on American news. If you put on Al Jazeera, they have their spin on American. Everybody has their own spin. But I just want you to see it from the sense of how Jews feel uh, in Israel. In other words, they're the ones that are surrounded by all of these people that want to push them into the ocean. Uh, and uh, or the Red Sea, I should say. But I'm just going to go through these real quickly. I'm not here to attack. I'm just going to read the Jewish voice. That's the name of the, the, the newspaper. And the first one, or one of the pages, this is just one newspaper. It says, Our World, the Legacy of a Teetering Peace. As Israel moves into the uncharted territory of managing its relationships with post-Mubarak Egypt, it is imperative that our leaders understand the lessons of the past. One of the first casualties of the Egyptian revolution may very well be Egypt's peace treaty with Israel. The Egyptian public's overwhelming feeling towards Jews renders it politically impossible for any Egyptian leader to come out in support of the treaty. And that, 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 is, that is the whole Islamic world. They hate Israel. And I, I mean, no matter what this biased liberal press in our country says, no matter what liberal teachers and clerics that come and talk on TV, this world in, the, in that part of the world, and not only them, others in other parts, but especially that part, they hate it. They don't want Israel to exist. And so uh, the leader, the head of the opposition right now in, um, in other words, the man that's heralded to uh, take over from Mubarak, a uh, democratic alternative to Mubarak, uh, by Washington neoconservatives has called for the peace treaty to be abrogated. Now, now this, this is the next leadership that's coming in. You see, you have to understand, Mubarak was a terrible dictator, but he wouldn't allow Egypt to go in and attack Israel. So that's why he was considered somewhat of an ally, the, because we were protecting Israel. And so, like they say, you know, the, the worst of the evils. All right, he was a terrible dictator, but we felt that at least he would be, you know, a, a defense towards Israel, which he was. But now you're going to have a leadership that possibly is going to come in there, and they're going to destroy this treaty, and guess what's going to happen? 
You think Israel's just going to, you know, sit down and, and watch it? They, they have to defend themselves. And so it goes on to say in this article, uh, uh, the, 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 this individual um, on the radio station said, the Camp David Accords are finished. Egypt has to at least conduct negotiations over conditions of the agreement. The Muslim Brotherhood has been outspoken in its call to end the treaty since it was signed 32 years ago. Whatever ends up happening, it is clear that Israel is entering into a new era in its relationship with Egypt. The good news is this, when you read Isaiah 19, somewhere, whether it's in the middle of the tribulation period, whether it's at the end, or in the millennium, it says that Egypt will be an ally to Israel. I don't know where that's going to be. But uh, the, the question is, is that, you know, is, is God speaking from a perspective of after the tribulation period that now you have these countries that align themselves with Israel after they see what God has done? Only God knows that. I'm not going to make any kind of uh, prognostication of when Egypt becomes an ally of Israel. But the way things look right now, Egypt is not going to be an ally of Israel at this present time. Second... Uh, article and I just want you to hear this so you understand that the, you know when you hear American news it's only a bias okay it's only a spin but it's not the real news team Obama stabs Israel in the back listen to this one can you imagine what the Obama administration's first priority is during the bloody riots throughout the Arab and Muslim world could it B, to enact security measures to protect United States interests in the Persian Gulf by attempting to bail out countries such as Bahrain? What about convening a summit to quell the violence or have the Secretary of State Clinton take more decisive action rather than spout platitudes on democracy? As it turns out, Team Obama has made every effort to betray yet another ally in the Middle East, this time the victim of such treachery is the paradigm of true democratic values, Israel. The United States joining the Palestinians and other terror-ruled Arab states like Lebanon has seen fit to publicly denounce Israel in the unholy institution of the United Nations. Team Obama remains transfixed on the false notion that Israeli settlements are the true obstacle to peace in the Middle East. What a joke. Think about this. You know, would you begin to understand that Israel is never the aggressor, never the invader, they're always being invaded? Think about the restraint that they held back when we went into Iraq and Iraq started to fire its missiles into Israel and we told Israel, don't do anything. Could we hold back that restraint if Cuba started hitting us with missiles? Okay. I mean, this is total, not illogical, it's insanity. And, and, and this is the problem. I do not see the voices that should be spoken uh, in, in, a, in a time such as this calling right, right, and wrong, wrong. Everything today is political correctness. And it, it, it's a shame that there are no voices today that speak truth for what it is. But he goes on to write in this article. While in so doing, the United States selectively chooses to ignore the fact that those protesting for the pur purported, purported democratic and economic reform in the Arab countries would love nothing more than to foster their own unique version of an Islamic revolution with the ultimate goal of creating an anti-Western caliphate. And th that's the bottom line. You have to remember, what was the last caliphate there was in history? Do you remember what that was? The Ottoman Empire. Yeah, the Ottoman Empire. And, and, and think about, you know, what, what had happened during that time. That was their whole purpose, to, to go in and conquer. And if they didn't submit, uh, they were killed. And that, that's, that, that's it. You know, Christianity, Judaism, has nothing to do with kind of, that kind of uh, uh, violence and hostility towards others. As a matter of fact, thank God that the Christians got to America first. Because we wouldn't be the country of freedom and liberty that we are today. Um, so that was another one. Okay. I'm not going to get into too many, but Advocates for Civil Liberty holds historic conference in Toronto. Listen to this one. 
Pro-Israel students are verbally humiliated and physically attacked. Professors in Middle East studies teach students only one point of view, the pro-Palestinian and the anti-Israel point of view. This is, this is unreal. Spearheaded and organized by a conference coordinator, Merle Cates, the ACL has established to advocate for civil liberty protection in Canada, particularly in university settings. Their efforts have been devoted to countering unbalanced anti-Israel messages from organizations whose objectives are to promote propaganda against the state of Israel with the result of inciting anti-Israeli sentiments and hostilities. L listen, and I, I just want you to hear clearly. Remember when, way back when we were doing prophecy, you know, we, we were questioning, how is all the world going to turn on Israel? I mean, you just see how this is coming about right now in the hour that we're living. This, this isn't Nazi Germany. This is going on all over the world right now. Like I said to you the other night, that there is greater anti-Semitism in Europe now than there was in the time of Hitler. This is the world that it's all about one country. It's about Israel. And until... The, the Christian church understands the fullness of this. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're living with our head in the sand. This is all has to do with, with, with Israel. But anyway, last but not least, and this is just an extra, which I didn't know about, war on terror. Jews in, Tur in Turkey, Jews in Turkey, fear attacks. Istanbul's Jewish residents afraid to leave home after Hezbollah's threats to shut down the missions. Um, in Turkey, there is no knowing what will happen tomorrow. What guaranteed the separation between religion and state was the army. But unfortunately, the generals who maintained this in the past are no longer around. Turkey is a dictatorship. They attack newspapers and there are raids against anyone who dares speak out against the government. Those who talk too much find themselves under investigation. Of course, you know, being a, a, a Jewish person there, you don't uh, last too long. This is happening. I just want to let you know, at this present time, I could go on and on, but I don't want to spend all night reading the news. We can, you know, uh, go on the internet for that. So tonight what I want to talk about uh, is what's happening right now that affects us all. The instability. What's happening right now? There are a lot of people right now, what are they doing? They're thinking about getting rid of their big trucks and getting those four-cylinder cars, right? <laughs> because, because of the oil situation. We've been through this before, you know. But never with all these other things going on at the same time, insurrection, you know, and uh, the Islamic, uh, you know, uh, extremism and so forth. All of this is happening. And, and, uh, and again, Hebrews tells us in chapter 12, it says everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And so uh, tonight I want to take you, if you will, to Luke chapter 12, 54 as we start tonight. You can see it up on the um, screen. But um, oil has become the new gold in the world economy. Not that gold isn't going through the roof right now either. But uh, oil explains uh, why the Bible focuses its end time attention in the Middle East. Um, the five top countries uh, in the world today uh, um, that have the greatest oil reserves are guess where? In the Middle East. Saudi Arabia is number one. Iraq, I, I'm sorry, Iran is number two. Iraq is number three, Kuwait is number four, and the uh, United Arab Emirates is number five. Now, just to give you a little idea, not, not that these countries don't matter, but right under those five countries, you have Venezuela, Russia, and Libya. Every one of those countries hates us. Think about that. They hate the United States. And so they actually uh, maintain those five countries um, or I should say the Middle East, they have on reserve some like, something like 1,716 billion, uh, you know, uh, uh, gallons, uh, I mean, barrels, rather, of oil. Uh, in other words, they, in the Middle East, 60% of the oil is under those sands over there. Now, what we need to understand is that the sophisticated uh, handling and processing of the oil that, of course, we see comes to the United States was uh, done by what? Western nations, basically our country. And, and uh, now uh, they've been nationalized. So let me explain how this works. These nationalized um, oil companies are controlled by just a few Arab leaders. I don't know how many of you remember back in the 70s, 
in New York when uh, our uh, former uh, mayor, uh, Giuliani, he was the district attorney. And uh, he went after the mob at that time. And what they found out was that every window that went into these apartments uh, had a mafia tax on it. That every time these guys were about to build some big skyscraper in New York, uh, the mob had a tax on the concrete. Now, I want you to understand what I'm saying to you. These Arabs, don't let anybody kid you, are nothing more than the Islamic mafia. They control the ups and downs. There is not a shortage of oil right now. That, it's not about supply and demand. What is happening, these gamblers on Wall Street, they call them speculators, they're gamblers. What they are doing is they're betting right now. And when they throw a bet and they say, because of the instability in our world, is going to increase the price of oil they bet on, and that's called futures. And so they're betting that the price of oil is going to go up based on the instability. When the Islamic Mafia or these Arabs sit down, they watch what goes on in the stock market. And once they see that these guys are betting that the futures of oil are going to go up, guess what they do? They rise the price of their oil. It's, a, it, it's one big game. And, you know, we're sitting back. And I, 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 I'm not going to attack our country, but I want to tell you something. There is a void in our leadership. I like, you know, the other night I'm watching one of these programs, and who comes on the uh, uh, show? Well, he didn't come on the show. He came on through the um, telephone. Donald Trump. And so the question that was asked to him was, are you going to run for the president? Because he's giving serious consideration to running as a, as a president. And he said, well, I'm not going to make that decision till June. But he said, we are selling our country out at this moment. And he said, if somebody doesn't get to the plate, we're not going to have a country left any longer. And I agree fully with what uh, he said. And you know what? Sometimes you need a businessman in there rather than a politician, especially a successful one. But I'm not here to promote any politics. What I'm here to tell you is that we are in deep trouble. But who's in deeper trouble? I believe that, again, there's no watchman today shouting from the rooftops, guess what? This is what the Lord said is going to happen, and the church needs to rise up to the occasion. How many know the only hope for this world is the restraining force of God's army, his church? And, and so watch this, because in Luke 12, watch what it says, verse 54 and Jesus said also to the people, when you see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway you say, there cometh a shower, and so it is. Oh, it's right up there. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be heat, and it cometh to pass. In other words, he says, you know, you guys can understand the signs out there in nature. And so when you see those things coming, you know, you're, you're aware of that. But watch what he says. He says, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? And that's my, if you want to call it, itch, spiritually speaking. Why the church hasn't done more than Glenn Beck. It, it irks me that we have supposed prophets in our midst and nobody is discerning the time that we are living in right now. But I want to just share some things so you can understand not only the time, but also our response to it. Because, again, I'll use Issachar. They knew the times, the children of Issachar. 200, a remnant group in Israel. But they also knew how to respond to those times. It's not only knowing what time we're in. But when you're in that time, what do you do? How do you respond? And so... Uh, if you will uh, just look with me carefully tonight at Proverbs chapter 18, verse 11. Without question, what has happened to our country? We have sold out our integrity to gratify what? Our luxury. What, what do you mean, Pastor? L listen to this guy. and I don't even think he was an American who wrote this. It's an article called The Power of Oil. His name was uh, Dilip Hero, and he wrote this. He said, the fact is that political leaders all over the world are committed to raising living standards through economic growth, 
heavily dependent on energy, which of course we know is oil and gas. Since 1932, when American oil companies acquired a stake in the oil reserves of Saudi Arabia, Washington's policies have been geared to securing Middle East oil at the expense of all else. Now this is important for us to hear because even at times we have defended certain individuals because of one thing, the bottom line figure, the oil, the money. And I want to say this, when the character of a nation becomes corrupt, guess what happens? The downfall, the slope starts. If the foundations be destroyed, once you sell character out for what? Cash, guess what? What, what, what do you become as a people? And, and, and I have to say this, we know that there is corruption in high places. The Bible says there is spiritual wickedness in high places, rulers of darkness in this world. But understand from Daniel, that these different demonic entities that go to and fro battling the angelic hosts of heaven, they are there to influence the leaders. Because once you influ influence the leadership, guess what happens? The people follow. And so what we're seeing right now is a battle. It's not a battle, again, of religion or even ideology. I know there's a lot of talk today about progressivism versus conservatism, capitalism versus communism. Get behind all that, and you begin to see that there's a real battle going on in the spiritual world. For what? For the hearts of mankind and, and, and for the souls of, of, of people. But notice what the Bible says in, in Proverbs, because this is important for us. 1811. It says, the rich man's wealth is his strong city. The rich man's wealth is his... So can I put another word up there? Oil. Oil is his strong city. What would happen if all of a sudden we couldn't get the oil that we needed? What would happen to our economy? Cripple it. Notice, and as a high wall in his own conceit, and what God is saying here, or the writer here, Solomon writing this, but God is saying to us in this is this, that uh, woe is the man that puts his trust in what? Riches. How many know on our dollar we have, we put our trust in who? In God. But what has happened, once you move God out of the picture, guess what? You bend then begin to put your trust in something else. And so if we go back to our foreparents, you know, uh, or I should say the, 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 the founders of this country, and you look at them, when they sat down, the first thing they did is they got together and they prayed. That's what happened. They, they, before they did anything, they prayed. And then they began to reflect and to begin to think. And they used, I believe, without question, the Bible as the foundation. And that's why we have the great constitution that we have. But little by little, over the last hundred years, we have seen more and more the elimination of those founding principles. And with that, character is corrupted. When you think of the character of our country today, think about and I'll just make it very simple. When people went to one another and a guy came over to, to lay bricks for you and he said, yeah, I'll do the job for $500,000, and you shook a hand. How I many know? Those days are far and few in between. Why? Because the character is no longer truthful and honest and of integrity. And that comes what? From the leadership and it trickles down. It says, you know, when the righteous, you know, are in office, the people rejoice. But when the wicked are in office, guess what? This great sorrow. And that's what we're experiencing. We're experiencing the beginning of sorrow. Why? Because there is corruption. Where does that corruption come from? Increased iniquity. And because of that increased iniquity, now you have what? Instability. And that's where we are right now. You will never stabilize until you change what? Character. The Re Reformation has to begin what? In the heart of man before it's ever done with his pocketbook. So watch this now because it's important for you to hear these facts. Number one, the consumption of oil just on a, uh, a daily basis, in other words, every day, is 86 million barrels a day. By 2015, it's projected to be almost 100 million barrels a day. Oil prices have quintupled five times in the last six years. 
Number three, the psychological barrier of $100 a barrel has been breached, and because of this, the commodities market is going wild right now. All of this I'm saying because of that statement, the rich man's wealth is his... <laughs> Think about it. Well, he put, he put oil here, but the Bible says is his strong city. And I believe this right now, that we are seeing God shaking everything because we don't know what's going to happen. We have no clue to what's going to happen. And I don't make, uh, as, as a preacher, I don't make any forecast of what's going to happen. Only God knows. I know how it's all going to work out. You know, I know the end result of this. But what we are seeing right now is, is a tremendous shaking. Now, the second thing that I, I want to share on this comes from Proverbs 22.7. Arab control, if you can go to that next one, Proverbs 22.7. Arab control of oil goes beyond the realities of supply and demand. This is, this is stuff you need to understand because it's not just the, 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 and of course the biblical aspect's important, but if you don't know what's going on behind the scenes, you're going to be lost in all of this. Um, what happened, and this is historically, uh, all of uh, the world's oil supply in the past has been traded in United States dollars. This is important, now listen. Which assured stability for the dollar and, of course, the United States economy. So every time they were trading these barrels of oil, it was done in United States currency, with, with the main currency. But back in, back in 1973, and uh, we remember those times at, uh, at the pumps and so forth, we had a lot of problems. We made uh, an agreement, or we had a relationship now with Saudi Arabia. And here was the relationship or the agreement. Uh, we said, we will be your ally, and we will, you know, be your protector. But at the same time, any time a barrel of oil is sold, it must be sold in United States dollars. That's the agreement that we made with Saudi Arabia. And so that would give the dollar primacy on the market and it would give stability to our economy. But then something happened on February 17th, 2008. Iran, which is what? Number two in oil. Remember I said Saudi Arabia was number one. Iran opened up its own trading exchange. And instead of trading in United States dollars, they trade in euros. What is that telling you? It's gonna shift the stability of the United States dollar. Because now euro becomes a player, what? On the oil market, and that's where what? The money is. And Biblically, see, people don't comprehend this. We understand because we understand prophecy. At least the people who have been coming to church understand prophecy. We understand that there, the Bible predicted that there would be a renewed Roman Empire. We know it as the European common market. We also know that the Antichrist or this global leader who's going to come on the scene comes out of this European Union. So he has to be in a place not only politically but economically strong. Because when he comes on the scene, there will be great instability in the world. And the euro, of course, right now at least, is, is part of that uh, uh, strength being exchanged uh, on Iran's market with, when it comes to importing and exporting oil. What does all this mean? Notice what the Bible says, Proverbs 22.7. It says, the rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is what? Servant to the lender. So, so the key is, and, and, and again, we're, we're looking at this from a world standpoint, the, the, the one who controls the money is the one who basically calls the shots. Up till this point in history, the United States was the major world power when it came to this. Now, if we don't understand, again, the spiritual aspect of this, why do I keep mentioning this on a, on a natural level? Because behind the scenes, what does the United States, what was its foundation all about? It was founded in the God of this Bible. In God we trust. But now you have an Islamic undertow. And what do they want to do? They want to undermine, listen to me, they want to undermine not capitalism alone. They want to undermine the God who has produced the wealth of this great nation who has been what? the strongest missionary outreach to bring the gospel 
of Jesus Christ to this world. See, it's a spiritual battle, but we're, remember what I told you in the beginning of this whole series back in June, I said, what you're going to see on earth is actually what's happening first in the invisible world of the battle that goes on. We saw that in Daniel. Remember when they were fighting over the kingdom, Babylon was in control, but then Persia would come along and they would over, you know, they would conquer Babylon. But where was the battle first fought? It was fought over what? In the heavenlies. What was it being fought over? It was being fought over the future of Israel. Everything has to do with the covenant that God has from beginning to end with Israel. Because like I said, if the promises of Israel are not fulfilled, then God becomes a myth and so does this Bible. Because God says that every promise that he makes to Israel will come to pass. And of course we saw the greatest one in 1948, when Israel became a nation. But see, once you understand, people, if you talk, if I went into, let's just say, Columbia tonight, and I said, you know, I'm going to speak to the students here, and, and, and I want somebody to, you know, rebuff me here or, you know, be my, uh, you know, contrary uh, debater on this. If I were to ask this liberal, you know, professor, why does the world hate Israel so much? He would only understand it from what aspect? The natural aspects. He would never be able to get into the realm of what God says in the biblical understanding. See, people, even in the church world, don't understand why there is this constant focus on the, on the anti-Semitism. Why, why isn't it against, you know, Italians or Irish or, you know, uh, Puerto Ricans or whoever it may be? Why against? Because it all has to do with what God says in his word. See, and once we comprehend that, we realize all this other stuff that we're seeing is what? It's just, uh, if you want to call it like a play, just the pieces. You know, just, just the people. It's what's going on behind the scenes that we have to get the greater perspective of. And so, uh, I've often said, you know, about the United States, I've, I've uh, you know, brought it up. You know, what's going to happen to us as a country? Is it going to happen uh, you know, as, as some people think, you know, or is it going to be something projected that uh, maybe uh, goes beyond our understanding? I, I really think the signs are here. And let me just share some of them. And don't get upset with because it comes with a great ending that I have for you tonight. But I, but I just want to share some important things. Remember what I said. The rich ruleth over the poor. The borrow is what? Servant to the lender. Let's go to number one, point one. There's three points I want to make real quickly. Number one, no question about the United States is the greatest debtor nation in the world. And yet we are the greatest consumer of oil. <laughs> Think about that. We owe the most money on our credit card, and yet we spend the most when it comes to oil. Who's the biggest lender? China. No question about it. Now, watch this and watch this carefully. Our present uh, interest uh, on this debt that we're talking about in the United States right now is $500 billion a year. I don't know if you can comprehend these numbers. Nobody can. Our, our, they want to raise the debt ceiling now to $16 trillion. Like I said, it's an avalanche. It's not a snowball anymore. This is an avalanche. It's, it's if you take the chart and you go like, and it's shh, like this. You know, they think cutting... $50 billion off the, off, the, off the debt is going to be, that's like you with a credit card and you got a $10,000 balance on your credit card and somebody says, here, take off $50. <laughs> What's that going to do? This, the, people haven't, because you know what? L l I'm not a financier, but one of the gifts that, you know, I, everybody has their own gift when, that I did well with in school was mathematics. And so I think of things really quickly in my head. I'll never forget my, years ago, my wife and I were sitting down when they were driving in the car, I'm sorry, and I said to her, I said, honey, listen to me. I said, these kids, they're crazy today. They're going out and they're mortgaging their houses with no money down. They're even throwing their, um, their costs in there, you know what I mean, their closing costs. And I said, they're doing this across the board and no banks are investigating them to find out they're not even making enough money to cover their loans. I said, when this thing balloons and blows, it's going to be a catastrophe. Now, this is way before all of this happened. Not because I'm so smart. Because it doesn't take, it just takes common sense. 
You, let me put it in practical terms. You have five credit cards, or you give five credit cards to your kids. They max them all out. Do you give them another credit card? <laughs> this is, we're broke. This country is broke, and we keep borrowing and borrowing and borrowing. And here's the sad part. You know who we're borrowing from? Our enemy. Imagine the guy next door who hates you. And now you're broke. You've just maxed out those five credit cards and you need another credit card just to keep going and you go to Max next door and you know he hates you. But he says, don't worry, I'll lend it to you. What Max knows is that there's going to come a time where I'm going to choke him because I'm going to raise those interest rates and if he, doesn't, if, he doesn't, if he doesn't pay that, he says, then I'm going to call in a complete marker or a debt. And that's the bottom line. This is where we are at. Let me say this in the nicest terms I know how. We are a runaway train right now. That, that's what we are. We're, and you know, I keep hearing these politicians, do you want to leave this debt to your children and your grandfather? Forget about leaving it. It's already left. It's, it's here. You know, you have five maxed out credit cards. Until you pay it off, that goes to the next generation. The next. But the problem is, is that everything continues to escalate. There is no one that's saying, and, and what, what happens? Look at our country. All of a sudden now we go to these states, New Jersey, Wisconsin, Ohio, Indiana. It's going to happen in New York. It's already happening. California. And we say to the people, look, here comes the CEO. Who's that? The governor. And he says, look, we've got a $5 billion debt. We have no money in the account to pay the existing pensions if they continue at this rate. And... At the same time, the unions want these same benefits. It's not a matter of the fat cats on Wall Street and the bankers, even though I think there's a lot of injustice in that. The problem is, is that if you don't have the money, then you can't pay the bill. And what we are seeing, and, and, and people don't get this, that if we don't make, not the cuts they're making, but drastic cuts. They've got to be draconian in nature. In other words, what I'm trying to say, it's if all of a sudden they're coming to your door and they're saying, you know what, we're taking your house, and you say, well, let me give you $50. Will that do you? It doesn't cut it. You're in arrears $10,000. They don't want $50. They want a good portion of that. And that's where we are right now as a government on every level, the, the, the national level, but also on the state level. And, and I'm going to tell you, and I don't stand here as a prognosticator, but I will tell you, it doesn't take a, a CPA to figure this out. If we continue this direction we're going, we won't have to worry about terrorists. We won't have to worry about, you know, being invaded by some other country. I'm going to tell you what we're going to fall from internally. That's what's going to happen. Exactly. And see, the problem is these, and I hate to, these educated young people, have no clue. All they want to know is, you know, uh, what's the newest iPod coming out? You know, uh, can I, uh, can I uh, get, uh, you know, this uh, latest uh, whatever it may be? And, and, and yeah, whatever it is. But, uh, but, but nobody, because we've never, only people who have been through the depression understand the horror of what it is to not have food on your table. Yeah. And, and, and so what I'm, what I'm saying to you, I'm not, I'm not trying to be, you know, like uh, melodramatic here. I'm saying what they're saying on TV, just as I said some years ago, I, I, I don't like talking politics, but I'm going to tell you. When we heard of our last election and, and you know, the Republicans, the, the, the Democrats, I remember saying to a few people, I said, you know, when you go into... Uh, a polit political race, what you have to do is basically unearth the, the history of that man or that woman that's running. That's what they're supposed to do. That's what they're paid to do. And I was listening to well-known, I'm not going to mention their name, Christian hosts on television that were saying these words that our present president was a centrist, meaning he was more in the center, that he wasn't all the way over to the left. And I turned to these individuals, intellectuals, these people, or one was a doctor and the other guy was an uh, a retired attorney. I said to them, even before the election, I said, are they kidding me? I said, look at this man's history. From the time he was in college till the time that, watch this, he went to church the people that surrounded his life. Now, let's bring it back to 
where I grew up in the 60s. I hung out with a group of hippies. Those hippies, you know the lifestyle that they had. Now, if I continued, okay, in that kind of lifestyle, could all of a sudden you say, boy, this guy, he's changed. Listen, you are known by the friends that you keep. You are known by, again, you know, the ideologies that you have basically promoted. Now, the reason I say all of this is so that we can have some clear and truthful conversation and communication of what took place. That for some reason, nobody wanted to go in this specific direction. And now, just like King Saul, remember what happened to Israel? They wanted a king. And God gave them the king they wanted. And what happened is when you begin to promote a certain agenda, liberal or otherwise, contrary to scripture, guess what's going to happen? You're going to suffer the consequences of that agenda. And what I'm saying is, forget the man. Uh, again, I'm not here to uh, 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 attack the person. I'm talking about what the person stands for, just as I stand for something. Somebody's going to attack me? Attack me on my Christian belief. I'm willing to take it. But on the, on the same level, we have to understand that there are, behind all of this, invisible powers that basically are working at this specific time. What are they trying to do? They want to undermine, not America, but for what America was founded on. That's why when they said the term, and I heard it with my own ears, the Constitution is always evolving. The Constitution is not evolving. It is etched in stone. Just like the Bible is etched in stone. You can't change it. I know they're changing a lot of the laws now, uh, our politicians, the, the legalities. But you know what? God's word is the same. Do not kill. Do not murder. Unless, you know, it, it's for defense. But you know what? We've disregarded that. Okay. A paradigm change? Well, well, yeah. Or, or just look at, you know, uh, basically... Uh, uh, what, what's happened in the area of, uh, of, of our country right now as far as this, this next generation. Why? We decided, you know what? What do you mean, keep holy the Sabbath? So we threw it out. But everything that you sow, then you reap later on. And what I'm saying to you right now, uh, again, it starts with increased iniquity, but then that increased iniquity brings forth instability. That's what we're experiencing now. I realize that there are other factors with the insurrections that's going on and also with the Islamic undertow. But listen, God is trying to get the attention, I believe, of the American people because we have stood in the past for what? Truth. Liberty. The pursuit of happiness. And so, number two, real quickly. I don't know how much time I have here. Okay, I'll, I'll finish up. Um, secondly, the long-term fiscal health of the nation is greatly endangered by the looming financial catastrophes of, again, entitlement programs. And I know we don't like to talk on these things, but I want you to hear this so you understand what's happening in our country. Both of them, Social Security and Medicare. Why is this so significant? Listen to this. This is a fact. The number of workers supporting each retiree in America, Social Security again, uh, has dropped from five workers back in 1966 to three workers today, creating great stress on the financial health of Social Security and Medicare. As baby boomers retire, entitlement programs that currently compromise 40% of the federal budget will jump to 75%. Now, I know these are a lot of facts, but I'm trying to show you why I personally believe that if something is not done on a spiritual tone in America, we're headed down this slippery slope right now. It's not going to be done in human terms. It has to be done in spiritual terms. Remember I said, before you see the observation of natural things, it has to be fought first in the heavenlies. That's where our battle is. Number three, and last of all, listen to this. At the G8 summit meeting back in uh, 2009, the Russian president displayed a coin labeled um, United Future World Currency and advocated for di diversifying the global currency system away from the dollar, a call echoed by two other countries, France and China. <laughs> I wonder why France and China. China we know. Why France? European Union. 
Think about it, okay? Listen to this. Former founder of Marxism, Lenin, said these words. The best way to destroy the capitalist system is to undermine its currency. That's what's happening right now. This is prophecy being fulfilled in another dimension, of course. But what we are seeing, basically, is the collapse of America, and nobody's shouting it from the rooftop. It started, what, with the spiritual, what, diminishing of value and absolutes. And now we are experiencing instability. And you know what? People are saying, well, you know, I'm still buying bread. I'm, I'm still driving my car. Still, listen, when it happens, when that, when that avalanche occurs, you know, you're, you're down at the bottom of the hill, you know, and you're, you know, people are, you know, well, what's happening? But when that thing comes down, forget about it. It buries everything and everybody alive. Do you know what they were doing right before the Depression? <laughs> Roaring 20s. Party, having a good time, life couldn't have been better. Okay, and that's what's happening. You know, when they say peace and safety, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I know there's all this stuff out there, but you know, I, 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 I sense that sometimes it's like also um, an avalanche of all these different facts. Sometimes you have to give these facts so people awaken that this is, this, is, this, is not a, this is not a joke. This is a reality. What we talked about years ago was prophecy, but now we're in prophecy. It's a whole different matter. So here's the bottom line. Can the United States protect its source of oil? I'm not going to get into all the details, but you can go home and read this if you want. It speaks about, in uh, Ezekiel chapter 38, a conglomeration of nations. Some of those nations we're aware of already, Russia, Iran, Turkey, the northern conspiracy of the Islamic nations. What are their intent? To come down and to destroy Israel. But listen to this. Author Paul Roberts, in his book, The End of Oil, On the Edge of a Perilous New World, he writes this. And think about this for a moment. Remember we just went into Iraq not so long ago? Watch what he writes. But with the counting, uh, continuing fiasco in Iraq, it is now clear, clearer than ever, that the most powerful military entity in the world in history cannot stabilize a country at will or make it produce oil simply by sending its soldiers and tanks. In other words, since the Iraqi invasion, the oil market now understands that the United States cannot guarantee the security of oil supplies for itself or for anyone else. And that's why when oil increases, nothing we can do about it. Nothing we can do about it. Understand that the Arab nations themselves, uh, the OPEC nations, have invested, listen to this, the astounding figures, $4 trillion around the world from its oil exports. Or exports. Remember what it says about the, the rich in the city? Understand, $4 trillion from these oil exports are what? They're buying up our real estate. They're buying up the United States. We, we, you know, who really owns the United States anymore? Think about it. I mean, th these are just things I want you to, you know, mull over. Muslim strategists, but this is the, this is the biggest thing that hit me. And I, I know I gave you a lot of facts tonight, but I just want to say this because I have a good thing to close with tonight. Muslim strategists ask their followers, listen to this question they say. This is over Al Jazeera. Why do we find in these modern times that Allah has entrusted most of the oil wealth primarily to Muslim nations. And here's their answer to the ones that were millions of Muslims who watch Al Jazeera. Allah foresaw Islam's need um, for funds to finance a final political religious victory over what Islam perceives as its ultimate enemy, a Christianized Europe-American civilization. It's all a spiritual battle. They talk about their God more than sometimes Christians talk about their God. That's the sad part of it. Everything in their life is God. From the time they get up till the time they go to bed, it's Allah, 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 Allah. And what are Christians doing? Well, God's got something good for your life. I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. We're in a battle. They understand that battle. So let me leave you with something that will uplift you. 
because that's enough bad news, right? Let me close with you if you turn in your Bible to James tonight, chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. How can we gear our wills and our emotions, especially in this hour, to keep going forward in these troubled and bleak times? Over 70 years ago, the great Christian writer C.S. Lewis, who wrote the book Screwtapes, and uh, many of you probably saw the movie Narnia and so forth, he wrote those. He was considered not only a great Christian, but he was an intellectual. And he was addressing at that time Oxford University right after England declared war on Nazi Germany. And listen to what he says to these group of the smartest of the smart in England at that time. They are, uh, the, Oxford is the R, Harvard, and Yale. Listen to how he addresses these students during that time. He says, this impending time has taught us some important things. Number one, life is short. The world is fragile. All of us are vulnerable. But we are here because this is our calling. What a powerful statement to make. God has called us for such a time as this. Why didn't he call somebody else? He called you. Think about how special you are for God to call you in such a time as this. Our lives are rooted not only in time, but also in eternity. And the life of learning humbly offered to God is its own reward. Now watch what he says. Danger is always part of our environment in this fallen world. Our task as faithful stewards of God's calling is to keep our duty to be patient and to remain spiritually vigilant, but also to keep on laboring. And that's the bottom line, church. We need to understand that this is the greatest time for the church of Jesus Christ. God said as much as there would be the um, onrush of, of evil around us, he said greater is the light than the darkness. He said he would outpour his spirit upon all flesh. And think about it. I mean, I, I just want to go back to my early beginnings as a Roman Catholic. When I grew up, I never heard the word born again. I never heard uh, the understanding that people have today. I mean, I guess the only one back then that maybe I had seen was like a Billy Graham on television. But think about now how our world through television and internet has been exposed to the message of Jesus Christ. Think about your Salvation, how you have first affected the next generation. Salvation never occurred, maybe, until it started right with you. And now your life is affecting the next generation. And so here's what James says. James 5, verse 7 and 8. First of all, be patient, therefore, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he receives the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your strength in your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And I believe this is most important for us to understand. We don't know the day the Lord is coming. But what God is, sh should be uh, speaking to every Christian's heart is that all the things that he said, they asked him, what are going to be the signs of your coming and the end of the world? He describes it in full. He says, this is not the end when he describes these different things that we've been talking about. Increased iniquity, the hearts of men will wax cold, uh, instability and so forth, um, ins insurrection, kingdom against him. He says, this is the beginning of sorrow. But once he gets done the beginning of sorrows, then he talks about the trouble that comes afterwards. Somewhere in this transitionary period of where he's talking about the beginning of sorrows and the great what we call the great tribulation period. He says, then when that time happens, he says, flee from the mountaintops of Judea. Who's he speaking to? He's speaking to the Jewish people at this point. He's dealing with them as a nation because Paul writes it in Romans. He says, after the fulfillment of the Gentiles, so shall all Israel be saved. I believe that God has allowed us through the work, writing of Isaiah to be that light at this time, at this season, because this final fulfillment or his final plan is not with the church it's with the people of israel how many know we have our greatest day ahead of us right now this is the church's greatest hour 
And I believe just like uh, Winston Churchill stood or spoke before the people of England uh, on radio and to the other allies, he said, this will be our finest hour. When he was saying that, you know what? They were being bombarded by the Luftwaffe dropping bombs on London. And what I'm saying, when it seems like it's the darkest hour, that's when God's church rises and the light is seen by all. And I believe that's what God wants to do in this hour. I, in my own spirit, sense that, again, I, 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 my prayer is that he gives us a reprieve. You know, my, my, my prayer is a reprieve, that, that, that somehow people will get the message and like Nineveh, they'll repent. That's my, that's my prayer. That's, remember I said, prepare for the worst, hope for the best. My greatest hope is that people will awaken, that this next generation will awaken, that the church will awaken. We cry out to God, say, God, have mercy on us. Give us some more time. Don't be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Lord, give us, you know, with these righteous that are praying, some extended time for our family and our friends. And God, I believe he hears the cry of the righteous. But, but understand this, okay, if we fail to do that... <laughs> There's going to come a time where he says his judgment is sudden and it's quick. And so God wants to wake us. You know, how many times you say to somebody, you're in a relationship, say, I'm going to give you another chance. I'm going to give you another shot. I'm going to give How many chances do you give? And, and, and that per you, you know what I'm trying? But God's ways are, are much more long-suffering than ours. And I believe God has given us a lot. Remember what we've done. We've basically tried to eradicate all of his design. Everything that he has planned under, uh, for us through the Ten Commandments, we, we, we basically pushed it out and said, we don't want it. We don't need you. Where do, where do we hear any longer our leadership crying out? We need to lift up our hearts before God. God forbid anybody says that in our country. And, and, and so what I'm saying simply is this. Like C.S. Lewis, he says, be patient. What does the husbandman do, the gardener? He waits, precious fruit. The Lord says, the harvest field is ready. The laborers we have to pray for. This is the season of reaping. I believe that with all my heart. This is the season that God wants to bring in his harvest. What does he need to bring it in? He needs the laborers. So we have to get out of ourselves, as they say, you know, out of that self-centered or egocentric style of life, and we have to see the harvest out there. You know, people say, pray for my family. We have to witness first to our family. You can pray for your family all you want, but you have to share your faith, family, friends, and so forth. You have to pray. And then, like I said, one does a little, what, seed planting, another does a little watering, and then God brings in the harvest. So I just want to encourage you. I believe in hope. I know that God has a specific plan, and I don't say this arrogantly, but we are a special people. God has anointed us for this hour. And we need to walk in that anointing, in, the, in, in, that, in that power and presence of God. Because let me tell you, human, human ways are not going to answer the problems that surround this nation and our world right now. I mean, oh, this is a spiritual battle. And uh, like I said, if God uh, gives us a reprieve. I will believe only because Christians got on their knees and prayed. People often say, how did those walls in Russia communism fall and then you know all of the communist countries i believe christians were praying for years and years and years for those countries over there for those missionaries over there they used to smuggle those bibles in to those communist countries but christians were praying so again we need to get back to that place and it, does one person make a difference you bet you bet paul one person made a difference and god's looking for a man or a woman to stand there make that difference so let's take our responsibility as seriously as those in a different uh, direction of faith, you know, a different world of faith that other people have, as strong as they are and confident in their specific belief. That's how we have to be as Christians. And we have to stop playing, as they say, church and get back to serious business. And that means we're going to have to really go before the Lord and ask for mercy. Amen? Okay. So... Uh, I, I, I got it done. I, I ran a little bit late here, but we'll just trust the Lord. Uh, like I said, I, I gave you a lot of facts tonight, and uh, I, I just want you to understand what, what I really am trying to do so everybody understands why I, I share from newspapers, why I share from history, politics, because I want to show you how all of this fits into the biblical tone of what God's Word says. You know, I can't just say, gee, we're in the last days. Who cares? Anybody could say that. Prophets... You know, come along, say this or say that. You have to back it up.
by what Scripture says, and then you align Scripture. You never align the, the, the worldly events and say, well, this is why we're in the last days. No, Scripture has to say certain things. And then once Scripture says that, then when you see these signs, he says, know that you're in that point of Scripture. Amen? So let's pray tonight. Let's ask God to help us. Father, I just pray for each and every person. Lord, um, as we stand and sit week after week, I realize that every one of us have a love for this country, that have a love for our families, that we don't want to leave our, our children or our grandchildren in a condition that they will look back and say, how could they leave us like this? Help us, Lord. And as, as, as countercultural as it may be, as, 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 as resistant as some that we love uh, may work against us right now, that, Lord, ultimately, that you said that if we speak the truth, it will not return void. I pray, Lord, that your people in this hour will not be ashamed, whether it's praying before a meal, whether it's sharing something redemptive or something that goes across a television network that they can use to, to bring out uh, a truth in your word. Lord, help us to be sensitive and awakened to the opportunities that avail us and let us see the seriousness, Lord, not of the cars, not of the houses, not of the things of this life that sometimes too much preoccupy our life. But let us see the souls, O oh God, of those that we care about, knowing that what does it profit a man if he has this whole world and ends up losing his soul? Help us, Lord, to be sensitive to that, O oh God, and not to be ashamed of the gospel that we so believe and treasure. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen and amen. Uh